Hello and welcome to the Be Glad movement. My name is Pollyanna and I'm on a mission to bring you as many stories as possible of good coming out of bad and reasons to be glad. And today I'm joined by Jas from The Independent Spouse. Say hello, Jas. Hello. Nice to see you, Polly. <laughs> Lovely to see you too. Thank you so much for joining me. I know you're super busy. Um, so I'm going to get out of the way, hand over to you and let you tell your story. Okay, so my story, oh, where to start? I think um, it would probably make sense to go back to the beginning when I was um, a child and I had, um, so I had a really happy childhood, really, you know, mid 90s, normal childhood. Um, but what was a little bit different is that my mum had multiple sclerosis. So it was quite a challenging childhood. Um, and the reality was that at the age of 11 when my mum was diagnosed and my little sister was seven it was that the two of us just grew up really quickly um, so how I found solace in this kind of strange home life that was very happy but you know we had to do a lot of the household things and we had to grow up and get involved really quickly right. but yes yeah, so how I found my solace was the fact that I loved drawing so I would disappear out into the garden with my pencils and I would draw all day and I would sit there and I would draw flowers and little bugs. I used to collect little bugs and I used to draw them intricately and um, loads of princesses. I used to love drawing princesses. Brilliant. Um, and it was kind of the only thing that I was ever very good at. At school it was the same, never very academic. I did well at school but I didn't really get it. Uh, it turns out that I am dyslexic, which I am very proud of now. But when you're a child and the only thing that you are good at is drawing, um, it doesn't, you don't realise how, when you turn into a grown up and you want to go to university, how you can actually make a career out of the fact that you're good at art, but not maths and science and all those things that seem to be really important. Mm -hmm. So I went on and did my A levels and focused on art, did art and design. Um, and I was really good at it and I loved it and what happened is I ended up going to art college where I did a graphic design degree which I also oh. love and sort of um, realised that that's where my passion was and that's the thing that I've only ever been good at um, and it, it took university to realise that actually design and art and graphics are things that you can make a career out of and you can do. Um, so I left university with a surprisingly good degree, considering how dyslexic I actually am. And um, I got a job as a children's book designer. Oh, cool. So I designed Disney books for children. Wow. So yes, books, which I loved, um, Power Rangers books, SpongeBob SquarePants, all these different Disney books, and I loved it. And I had a six-year career doing that oh. and it was, we went all over the world we went to germany went to australia i had um you know conference calls with john laster who is the pixar director oh, um, wow. yeah really good and generally i was sort of living the career dream and had oh. everything in front of me and was really happy and loving it and then <laughs> like all military spouses I fell in love with my future husband. Uh -huh. So this was a time where RF Lynham was still open. So he was living in Lynham. I was in Bath where I had my job and my friends and all my security. And, you know, it was great. We spent uh, four years together at that point before we got married. Um, he would go off and he would do his thing. I would stay in Bath and do my thing. And separately and together, we had very good independent careers and we were having a great time. Um, unfortunately, this was the time of Afghanistan. So mm. he was flying, so he's a Hercules pilot. He's a C-130 transport plane pilot. Mm. Um, and during the time that the Afghanistan war was happening, um, he was really, really operational. So he would um, go away for up to three months at a time, very short notice, because um, the Army and the Navy are a little bit different to the Air Force, so 
I think generally the Army and the Navy, they have their six months and their nine month deployments and they do it in a big chunk. Whereas with him, because he was flying to Afghanistan every so often, he would do three weeks here, nine weeks here, three months there, all over the year. Right. So he was constantly operational, constantly flying to Afghanistan. Um, and he was away all of the time. But it was fine because I had my career, I had my job, I had my Disney books, um, mm -hmm. and life was good. And yes, I missed him terribly, but it was okay. Um, let me swallow as well and breathe a little bit. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Too much. Don't worry at all. How are you feeling? Are you feeling emotional thinking back to that time? Or are you just feeling a bit like, oh, where am I taking this? I think, I, yeah, so I think I am feeling a little bit emotional. So I like to think of it as a positive time because I was really, really happy then. Mm. And, you know, I had this wonderful career. But the underlying sort of constant worry was a bit, a bit much. And I had loads of support from my friends. So I was on a hockey team, loads of friends from that, and it was brilliant. But the reality was that my life continued normally. And I had this constant fear that somebody was going to knock on my door. That's the reality of it. Yeah. It was a time where, um, so it was very popular in the news. So there was a lot of coverage of Afghanistan. Mm. And the thing was, if somebody had died, they would shut down all the communications so that the news would be properly given to the families and they would be told the facts and it wasn't going to be something that was leaked or accidental. So it was, um, so it must have been 2011 and 2012, those summers, they were really hard because every day somebody died. Oh. So I didn't speak to him for weeks and days on end. And all I was getting was this little bit of coverage on the news and no other information. And it was really difficult. And in fact, my friends, um, they sort of looked after me. They were really good at looking after me and they'd take me off to the pub and we would, you know, those long summer evenings where you have a pint and you have a good chat about stuff. And um, the reality was that they sort of understood and they looked after me, but they didn't quite get it. And we used to spend nights, we had a plan. So we had a plan where something happened to my, well, he's my boyfriend at the time. Sure. One of my friends was, would fly and get his parents over here. And one of my other friends would take time off work and drive me to where I needed to be. And it's really quite, looking back now, a really surreal concept that I had like a, like a team of people yeah. planning what to do if something happened to my boyfriend. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, really strange. That is a very strange thing to have to do. Somebody in their like mid-twenties thinking about the, the worst thing that could happen to them. Oh. Um, but I had a support network and I had my job and it was brilliant. <clears throat> so after that, so RF Lyndon closed, basically is what happened. And he was posted to Rise Norton, which is not for sure. So I was still living in Bath. We are now living together, really happy, seeing him in the evenings when he could. But he was now second in command of the squadron, which is a very busy job. Um, so he was commuting the three hours, an hour and a half each way, to Bryce Norton, coming home in the evening, almost running the squadron, flying, having to you know get his flying hours up. And he came home after a really long, miserable winter of snow and sleet and the motorway being closed. And he was like, look, I know that you love your job and I know that you're already happy here, but I can't commute anymore. Right. That was the reality of it. He couldn't cope with another closed motorway and the snow and the sleet and the fact that he was doing short notice medevac flights to Germany. So um, if, if the serving personnel's family gets sick in the UK, then they would fly the family that are posted in Germany back to the UK so that they could see their family. Or um, equally, if they got sick in Germany or in Cyprus, they would go and pick them up and bring them back to the UK. Uh -huh. This was always really short notice stuff. So he would always dash off. Normally after I'd started cooking dinner, uh -huh. there was one time <laughs> where I'd um, just put the steak on. We were cooking steak, steak and chips, something like just put the steak on and he was out the door. I remember that um, quite, um, quite well, actually. Um, 
And along with that, it was still doing Afghanistan, still being operational, still never really being in the country. So we decided together that we would move to Bryson Norton. But we weren't married at this point, so we didn't qualify for a married quarter. Sure. Um, so we moved into a private rental, which was also great. We moved to Whitney, which is just outside of Bryson Norton. Mm-hmm. And it is a lovely place, actually, Whitney. It's a good part of the world. It's a nice place. But because we lived in a private rental as, you know, civilians, like surrounded by civilians, mm. there wasn't really the community at all. Mm. Because civilian people don't talk to their neighbours, um, which is normal for them because, you know, it takes a couple of years, you get to know them, and you talk to your neighbours, and that makes more sense. Yeah. But we had just moved in and I knew nobody at all. I had never lived anywhere that I didn't have friends. I was born in Cheltenham, went to Bath, that was it. Those two places where I had a whole load of friends and I was really comfortable. So it was a bit of a change to move to somewhere that I didn't know anybody. Sure, massive shock to the system really. Yeah, it is, it is a strange thing to do, for like a first first move now I'm quite used to it all the time but at the time it was very different very very different for me um so we're living in Whitney and Afghanistan is still happening it's the it's the close down to that so the Herc the Hercules are really busy mm-hmm. doing all the flying and I had nothing to do at all. I left my job. I left my lovely hockey team, my lovely friends, and I'd moved to Whitney where I'd only ever been once before. And I um, just sort of felt a bit sorry for myself, actually. Yeah. Because if you're not in the sort of, you're not married and you're not in the military gang, you don't have that. And if your friends are 60 miles away, you know, they come for weekends, it's great, but they're not there for a cup of tea when you need them. Sure. And I sort of fell into this weird sort of spiral where I would get up on a Monday morning and not leave the house until the Wednesday because there was nowhere to go, there was nothing to do. After six months being in a place, you've been to all the shops, you've done all the wildlife parks and the pet shops um. and the toilet centres, you've done it all. Um, and the only reason that I would go out on the Wednesday is because I'd run out of food. And that was okay. it. And for weeks on end, the only person that I spoke to was the woman in Sainsbury's. Um, it's, it's really quite bad for your mental health, it turns out. Sure. And I just had gone from this world where I was in this industry and, you know, making big decisions about publishing and, you know, winning awards and doing things that people listen to, to this world where it actually didn't matter if I was there or not, because nobody really knew. Yeah. And that's not saying anything against my friends or my family. They supported me when they could, but people have busy lives. And I sort of fell into it. I didn't choose to be like that. I just, that's, that's how my life became, yeah. really. Mm-hmm. Um, and that went on for about, gosh, it must have been about two years that I struggled with, finding my way and finding my place um, so I was still doing a little bit of freelance so I still was designing I was doing the odd children's book but the reality is when you leave a job and leave a company and move to a different county they sort of forget you <laughs> so right. people in the company get promoted and then they don't send you work or there's a new person gets employed and so the work sort of fizzled out basically right so now I was stuck in this this place that I'd never lived before with my boyfriend constantly being away um, with no friends and no hockey team and no work now. Um, and I really should have given myself a kick at the bum to sort myself out, but you don't know that at the time. You just sort of bimble through life generally anyway. Yeah. But yeah, I should have really given myself a kick at the anyways. But now mm-hmm. I had realised that... I enjoyed working and actually my sort of my sort of what got me really passionate and my role wasn't going to be as a wife and a housewife and and that side of things because I need to be motivated I need I really enjoy work I love designing 
I think because designing and graphics and art has, have been the only things I've ever been good at. Yeah. It's a really important part of me. So without that, my creative side just goes. And without my creative side, there's not really much happening. Oh. So I realized that my business was the way that I needed to go. And I need to be passionate about my business and I need to grow that. And I have seen other people doing it. And I know that actually, if I could grow my business and take inspiration from these people, that actually that might be the good route to go. Yeah. And I made the decision, we were sat, and this doesn't sound, um, it wasn't it was awful as it sounds at all. We were in Antigua <laughs> on holiday. Right. So I went, we realized, me and my husband, well, boyfriend at this time, realized that we hadn't really seen each other for months. We flew out to Antigua, one week on a beach, because that's all the time he could take. And uh, it was the turning point. I said to him, I am I'm miserable. I mean, it's not your fault at all. Um, I know that you love your job, and it's fine. And I made the decision to move to Whitney too. But actually, I really want to do something with this design thing. I want to see if I can do it, because I don't want to, you know, look back at, in 50 years and go, oh, I could have done something. I could have, you know really achieve something in business yeah and at the time I had a thousand pounds in my business bank account and I threw all of that money into an online course from a woman in Canada okay and every week she'd give you tasks to do so one week it would be Facebook tasks one week it would be sorting out your email list it would be uh, going networking and I was like right this is my chance I'm gonna throw my money at this I'm just gonna buckle up and I'm going to do everything. I'm going to try everything. Right. And eventually it started to work. And I molded my sort of freelance bits and bobs design work into a company that I now is now Design Jessica, which is my company that I still do, that um, I work really hard on. And um, yeah, it's sort of grown from there. Um, mm -hmm. And what I realized, so this July, which would be five years since that time at Rise, mm -hmm. and three more postings, I realized that nobody should ever feel as miserable as I was in those years in Whitney. You shouldn't mm -hmm. ever sit in your house and not go anywhere <laughs> except for Sainsbury's because uh -huh. you've run out of food. And nobody should ever feel that way. Um, and you know and I realized that even though it wasn't really my choice I didn't do anything about it because I didn't know that I could do anything about it sure. there wasn't anything that I saw that was a military spouse that had got a bit lost that had found their way back again and had achieved something you know half decent yeah so I've been toying with this idea for, for a long time um, and I knew that I wanted to I knew that back in Whitney I wanted to hear the stories of people that had done this so I knew it was achievable and that's why in July I started a podcast series so the podcast series which is the independent spouse which is the reason that I'm here um, is me the designer interviewing other military spouses that have achieved something so normally it's a business, I try to fix a business, but it can be a challenge or, um, you know, something that they've achieved that I think is remarkable but achievable. Oh. Um, because I just think that what we are doing, despite Afghanistan and, you know, all the operational things that have happened since and all those, you know, that, that challenging military life that we live in, should be um, showcased and celebrated because my husband gets medals and that's great and I think it's brilliant and he works really hard and he gets a pat on the back and he gets a salary and he gets his medals but I am a little bit in the shadows and that I think actually I'd quite like to you know achieve something too and get a bit of a pat on the back and be looked after um, and there's so many of us that are doing so many amazing things that should be showcased because we are we are acing it basically and I think it's really important. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to half of me is to celebrate it and half of it is to to show people that 
yeah, military life's a bit crummy sometimes. And, you know, you spend an awful lot of time worrying about things and an awful lot of time moving house or not living where you want to or, move, or leaving your friends. And actually, the one thing that you probably have control over is what you choose to do for your job. So the ones, the, the, the military spouses that have decided to go and start their own businesses is something that we completely control. And I think that's really important because we need to be empowered to know that we can control something. Because in a world where you don't know where you're going to be living or you don't know when your partner's away, you don't know where your children are going to go to school. All those sort of crucial things that civilian type partners get to choose, we don't get to choose. And I think if we can, you know, have just something that is ours that we can control and we can showcase and we can, you know, send out into the world and make amazing things with, then that's really important. Okay, I totally agree with you. And I've been sitting here nodding, and but I didn't want to, because there's so many times I could have interrupted you and gone, me too, me too. Because, <laughs> you know, when my husband and I got married um, and we moved away from all my friends and family and up to our Blooming at the time, he was still in the Royal Marines at the time, but um, it was so difficult because we knew we were only going to be there a short while as well. And it's sort of like, do I bother to make friends? I didn't sort of not, do stuff and I was lucky that I was on a patch but um there's sort of that feeling of being in limbo and also sort of you know who am I anymore I've lost my job I, I, well I've not lost it I chose to walk away from it and especially when you said about the sort of like friends not understanding where you are because so many people would be like that sounds amazing you can stay in bed all day and it's like yeah but that's really miserable that maybe have have does have a little bit of a, a pro you know it's, it sounds exciting for like two days and then it's just like uh who am i why do i exist you know <laughs> so i totally totally get where you're coming from and um i love the independent spouse podcast idea the sort of showcasing what is achievable around this kind of crazy hectic life that we lead um and you know what else popped into my mind we almost need to do like a how-to video that gets shown to people before before they embark on a relationship with someone that's in the military. This is what the reality of it is, you know. Because I, I know you shared a post the other day about, um, you know, what, how do you reply to someone that says, well, you knew what you were getting yourself into, which is like the worst thing that you can say to a military spouse because it's just not like that, is it, you know. No, and the reality is that, yeah, we had a little practice to start with, but I was 20 odd back then, and I wasn't married, and I think anybody that gets into marriage, you just don't know what you've got yourself into, because marriage is a strange thing, thing in itself, yeah. and to add this kind of operational military life on top of that it makes it a whole different ball game. Um, but what I'm really keen to stress is that military life isn't horrendous. I have... That initial sort of two or three years when I was in Whitney and feeling sorry for myself, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Especially because my family, I, because my mum was poorly, I don't have that same support system that some other people have. So it is just me. And I have felt very lonely and very much I'm the only person I can rely on. And that's no reflection on my husband because he is brilliant. And there is a reason that I chose to marry him. It's oh. just that he is very passionate about his career and the same way that I'm very passionate about my career. Um, but yeah, military life is not all doom and gloom. It's not all crying into tissues and waiting for our husbands to get home by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it is, it's a challenge. It is definitely a challenge. But looking back now, at this point, I wouldn't have achieved half the things that I did achieve if I hadn't have gone through that that, that painful couple of years where I lost my way and I didn't know what I was doing. And even though that really sucks, um, I wouldn't change. I would change the fact that it took a long time to work myself out, but <laughs> I'd like that to be a bit shorter. But looking back now, I'm just really proud of what I'm doing now. And I know that I wouldn't have done that if I hadn't have known how bad it was. I wouldn't have been inspired to do the independent spouse to show people that it's not all bad and that actually amazing things can happen. Yeah, I wouldn't have done that if I hadn't have had those sort of rubbish years. Sure, sure, okay. Yeah, because like you said, the, the 
not working gave you time to reflect on you know that holiday in Antigua when you said you know I know that I need to be working you sort of recognize that in yourself um, and then also recognize that, that, that if you're feeling like this there's going to be other spouses out there that are feeling, feeling the same yeah and I hope it I hope that those that have contacted me and have said that actually that they agree with me because it's not all shiny I mean you can look at my Instagram and it all looks very shiny and well designed but that's because I'm a designer generally yeah. I'm doing it <laughs> that's the, but the truth of anybody in life we're just hoping for the best and making it up but I really hope that it sort of gives a reality to this world that I'm living I have a vlog series on YouTube that's called The Magnolia War Life because these okay. houses in Magnolia. Um, <laughs> it sort of gives a behind the scenes, so it's not like a highly polished, shiny, this is how to do business sort of thing. This is kind of crumbs if she can do it, then anybody can do it. You know, it's a bit aspirational, it's a bit inspirational, but mostly it's sort of a positive, it's a positive re reflection of military life with a little bit of you know, oh, it's a bit bad, but but we can do it because for hundreds of years, I've said this before, for hundreds of years, military spouses and mostly wives have had to do this. And my granny did it in World War II. Um, and, you know, the army's been around for years. The navy's been around for years. The RAF, we're getting there. <laughs> but you know, there's women that have, have done this already and... You know, if they can do it, then I can do it. And as long as it's not got a positive spin and something happens in the long term that's good, then actually, you know, it, it's okay. It's not, it's not too bad. Sure. Very cool. Yeah, that's, I mean, we're speaking from the same page, really, because that's exactly what I'm like, trying to grab the positive out of the, um, what could, initially seem like the negatives you know and and like you say it's not all negative I've got a fantastic gym just up the road a play park down the road for my son it's all brilliant so um although there is the strain of being away from friends and family and then like you say they're not there just for a cup of tea when you need them you can ring them up on Facebook message them and all those things so um yeah exactly I still think there needs to be that training video maybe that's something that you can do for um the new newbie girlfriends and wives and future husbands and whatnot so that we can all understand each other on on what it's like when you get started so uh, yeah excellent well thank you so much is there anything else you want to sort of say or tell us about while i've got you here i think i just want to say that if you're a military spouse and you are feeling a bit crummy, maybe it's your first posting, or maybe you've sort of lost your way along the sort of, you know, this, this, this crazy military life that we live in. That the reality is, I think a few of us have probably been there. And don't feel like you're alone because you're not. We've all done it, I think. We've all had really rubbish times mine lasted a few years which was terrible but um you're not alone and that it's okay to be grumpy and you can do shouting and jumping up and down and throwing things if you want to but just recognize that you're not alone and there are other people out there who will look after you and will back you up um and find those people and keep hold of them um and look after them and i am always around if anybody needs me in the same way that probably I'm sure you are yeah um, and it is okay in the end you just have to get through it and it'll be fine in the end 100% awesome and I'll share all the links to your um your social media at the end as well in the, in the description under the video I hadn't realized you'd got the I knew about the independent spouse and um in your design business but I didn't know about um the magnolia blog <laughs> That's very cool. I'll, I'll share all of that um, after the video. But thank you so much for, for joining me. I really appreciate you taking the time because I know you're super busy. In fact, you're even busier than I originally thought you were. So. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Jazz. I really appreciate it. If you like this video, please do hit the like and subscribe button and you'll get notifications when new videos are uploaded. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. If you search at Be Glad Movement, you should be able to find us. Um, 
please do get in touch if you've got a story that you'd like to share. It really doesn't matter if it's similar to somebody else's story because I do believe your story in your voice has the, the ability to reach someone and help someone in their time of need. So please do get in touch and I look forward to seeing you in another episode. Many thanks.